as we get underway today with our lesson, we continue in a series coming from the book of Luke, a series of parables that our Lord and Savior Jesus told that aren't found in any other gospel account. So as we think about our particular parable today, which comes from the book of Luke chapter 16, reminded of a story of two old men, I should say two older men, two older men, and they've gone golfing on the golf course and suddenly this beautiful, attractive woman comes up and uh, kisses one of the old men and she walks away saying, I'll see you at the pool after you're done. And the other guy says, is that your wife? Uh, he said, or is that your daughter? He says, no, that's, that's my wife. He says, your wife? He goes, how did you marry her? Well, he said, I lied about my age. He said, well, what did you say? How old are you? He said, 77. He said, well, what did you tell her? He said, uh, uh, did you say you were 57? He said, no. I said, I was 97. So... <laughs> Well, he got what he got because of his actions, and that's what we're dealing with here this morning as we consider the parable of the unjust steward. Now, Jesus actually told similar story here with that particular parable, and he's talking about this man, and we just read it, but we're going to get into the, uh, a different translation, I think, kind of brings it out a little bit better for us, but... As we consider the, the uh, parable, what we're looking at is this guy who uh, is a manager. He's the steward of the whole dealings and corporation of this rich man. The rich man represents God. This guy, we don't know who he represents. We don't know if he's good, bad, or ugly. That's what's interesting about this particular story. Uh, but as we go through it, I think you'll realize that uh, just exactly who this man is. Okay. Here's, our, here's our story. And Jesus told this story to his disciples. So he's talking to his disciples. But the Pharisees and other people are also there. So they're they're listening in on what he's telling his disciples. He says, there was a certain rich man who had a manager handling his affairs. One day, a report came to him from, uh, from the manager who was, watching his, uh, who was watching his employee's money. So the employer called him in and said, what's this I hear, uh, what's this I hear about you? Get your report in order. Because you are going to be fired. Anybody here ever had that kind of experience? I did. I was uh, working for Coca-Cola and uh, was delivering all these. Uh, back then they had bottles. Bottles, right? not the plastic stuff. So when it's uh, 95 degrees out and you're driving them trucks and you're shaking all the seltzer bottles and all that stuff, they, every time you try to pick up a bottle, it explodes. Well, anyhow, it was uh, uh, the last day that I was working there and the store uh, guy had saw me bring the truck into the loading dock and I unloaded all the Coke, all the product, and, uh, and I left it. I used all the carts, all those carts for all the sodas and, uh, or as some people say, all the Cokes, right? We, Coke represents every drink there is. So, uh, so I use all those carts. And all these other people are coming in. Like the bread people and the hostess people and all the other people. And there's no carts. And I've used them all. So the store manager got mad. And he called Coca-Cola and said, I was doing a terrible job because I used all the carts. But I used what I had at my disposal, didn't I? Right? No one told me otherwise. 
So that's what I did. Well, they didn't like it, so they said, you're fired. I didn't care anyway. It was my last, my last day. I was getting ready to leave anyhow. And uh, so someone else had to come in and do my work for me. And so Jesus is telling a story about a similar uh, action here. We don't know if this guy was morally corrupt. We don't know uh, if he did things on purpose. It just said that he wasted this guy's money. And, uh, and as he's wasting this guy's money, the rich man hears this report about what's going on. And so he says, uh, clean out your lockers, you're going to be fired. And so we'll continue reading. He says, the manager thought to himself, now what? My boss has fired me. I don't have the strength uh, to dig ditches and I'm, not, I'm too proud to beg. Ah, I know how to ensure that I'll have plenty of friends who will give me a home when I am fired. So he invited each person who owed money to his employee to come out and discuss the situation. He asked the first one, how much do you owe him? The man replied, I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. So the manager told him, take the bill and quickly change it to uh, 400 gallons. And how much do you owe? my employer. He asked the next man, I owe him 1,000 bushels of wheat, was the reply. Here's, uh, here the manager said, take the bill and change it to 500 bushels. The rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. And that's what our, we're talking about today. One shrewd dude, right? We got to find out if this guy's good bad or ugly. And it is true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are the children of the light. Here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. If you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy about your worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you are not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with the things of your own? No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Now you heard the expression mammon, God and mammon. Well, that's the idea. Mammon is simply a word, a Syrian word, an Arab, uh, Aramaic word that uh, means money or wealth. Eventually, it came to be used for an evil influence. But back in the day, in the, uh, with its original usage, it simply meant money or wealth. And, uh, and so it is here that he's talking about money. So when he's talking about mammon, he's talking about money. And they were, he's warning against being enslaved to money. But notice what he says about the Pharisees. He says, the Pharisees, who clearly loved their money, heard all this and scoffed at him. Then he said to them, you like to appear righteous in public, but God knows your hearts. What this world honors is uh, detestable in the sight of God. So when they heard Jesus talking about this matter, two things they despised about what Jesus taught. They despise the idea of sin. They despise the idea of being a sinner. And so they looked upon themselves as not being sinners. How dare you talk about us in that way? We are not sinners. And I used Jonathan Edwards' 1747 uh, sermon title, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, which is uh, quite a revival of the New England area in 1747, which, by the way, Jonathan Edwards and his group 
They believe that you couldn't understand God's word without some direct supernatural uh, intervention that somehow infused into your mind supernatural understanding so that you would understand the word of God. Now you think about that in light of John Edwards preaching revival around New England to try to win people to the gospel. Think about that. It's a contradiction. If it takes the Holy Spirit to make you understand, why is Jonathan Edwards going around preaching? Right? What's his preaching going to do? Nothing. Not until there's some miraculous experience. So they despise the idea of being sinners, but they also despise what he had to say about mammon, about money. Money. Show me the money. Remember that, that movie? Jerry Maguire? Show me the money. Well, that's exactly what the Pharisees were about. They were about living for money. And they did it everything and at all costs to gain power, to gain influence, and above all, to have money. And so this is exactly what the Holy Spirit says here, is that they clearly enjoyed their money. And so Jesus comes back and he says, you know, you guys are enslaved to your money. You're enslaved to your idol. Now, although mammon means money, and the context is dealing with wealth, we can also say that it's an idol. So in that respect, we can generalize it. Whatever in your life is an idol to you, is something that you go after in your life, something that you put first in your life, something that is far above and beyond your service to God. That is, it comes first before God. He says, you have become a slave to. That's what Paul says here in Romans chapter 6. He says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Now, see, don't, don't you feel the pressure of Paul there? Now, God's speaking through Paul. And God's telling you and me, when you become Christians, you got to change. You got to try not to sin. Now, the Romans didn't quite understand that. They thought, well, we've been baptized into Christ, so we can just have a ball. And they did. And so Paul asked the question at the very beginning of the chapter. He says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Do you remember his answer, rhetorical response? God forbid. He says, for as many have been baptized into Christ have died to sin. You've died to sin. And so he says here that you are not to let sin reign in your mortal body. That you should obey it in its lust and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Well, he's not talking about any law, but he's talking about the law of Moses, which he's been writing about. The law that we are under is the law of faith or the law of Christ, the gospel. And in that law, we're told things that we must do and things that we are to avoid or not do. And so that within itself puts us under law. Remember, what's sin? Sin is the transgression of the law. So whenever we sin, we're violating law. We are under law. And so he continues to tell them about this predicament. He says, what then? Shall we sin because we are under, not under law, but under grace? Here's the second question. The second time he asked that question. Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey? You are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you, uh, uh, to which you were delivered. 
And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So as we have become converted to Jesus Christ, and we have, been, uh, we have put Jesus Christ on in baptism, and now we have activated the blood of Jesus Christ in our lives, that blood continually cleanses us from our sin. But he says, while that's true, and that's grace, you can't find yourselves running after sin. You can't willingly go after sin. You can't obey unrighteousness. You can't obey your lusts. You can't obey your sinful desires. He says, but rather you are to be slaves to who? To Christ. Often we find ourselves slaves to ourselves. That is our our desires, our appetites, our lusts. And so it is, he says, that ought not be. But why should that not be a part of our lives? Well, he says, because you were baptized into Christ. You were buried with him. And then you were raised to walk in newness of life. We're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Paul says in Colossians 3, that the old man has died and now we have the new man to live by. He says, put to death the old members. Put to death the old man. Put to death the old ways of sin. That's why it's necessary for us to change. Otherwise, our conversion is absolutely useless. Because of the willingness, our uh, willingness to sin rather than to curtail it. So he says... I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. So basically, we have been set free to become slaves. Slaves to Jesus, slaves to righteousness, Slaves to his way of life. And really slaves to one another. Slaves to others. That's our goal. That's our purpose. That's, that's our responsibility. And so it is here that Jesus is really pointing this out in this parable. The fact is, is that there's two aspects to our stewardship. There's an intentional aspect and there's a missional aspect. Aspect. The intentional aspect is that we actually intend, we understand the purpose, and therefore we're going to go all out with that intent, just like this man was doing. Now he, he, was, he was actually taking or stealing, if you will, from the rich man, because he went out and he asked those people that owed him money, he said, well, if you owe him this much, Cut it down to half. It'll make you look good. It'll make me look good. But above all, what was his motive? What was his intent? Well, he knew he was going to get fired. So he made plans by befriending these folks by, uh, with them that they would remember him when he was down and out and they would take care of him. They would help him out. Now, Jesus is not here condoning the bad actions. He's, in, he's condoning the, the uh, what do they call that? The ingenuity, if you will. The guy's uh, idea of trying to do the best he can with what he has. And so that's why he says, concerning, he makes the contrast, he says, those in the world, they go all out. In trying to make a dollar. They go all out and they plan. And they purpose. And they try to do what's best for themselves. He says but when it comes to Christians. When it comes to children of light. We're not like that. We, we kind of we back off. and We're not as aggressive. In trying to help our future. And so the whole point is. Is that we are to be industrious. We are to be creative. We are to have some ingenuity with what we have. The point is we're stewards. And we have to take care 
of that which God has given us. Now here it's talking about the money. It's talking about wealth. But generally speaking, we are stewards of everything God has given us. All good gifts come from the Father of lights, right? We have been given good gifts. We are to be stewards of those gifts. And then, of course, the money that we have. The money that we have is also to be taken care of. It's not our money. It's his money. We need to understand that. It's not, it's not my money. It's his money. And he wants me to use that money to befriend others, to help others. Now, we, we did that a couple years ago, did we not? We had a big old flood down the road. And we provided those people with assistance, both food, some monetary, but also in restoring what they lost with furniture and other items. I can't say we made a lot of inroads gospel-wise, but certainly it's on the minds of those individuals. And who knows what the future might hold because of the influence and the impact that we had on those folks. Remember, it's about God's timing, not our timing. We like, we like things to, take hap you know, to happen now, uh, but we're working on God's clock, not ours. So as we consider the intentional, we also have the missional. The missional is this. God has given us money to help others. God has given us money to help one another. God has given us money to help with the work of the kingdom. That's what our money ought to be used for. It ought to be intentional. It ought to be missional. Remember what we were talking about last time was the fact that we are to seek what first? Seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness. And then all these other things will be added unto you. Do you believe that? And so he's saying set aside, budget, budget your money, budget your time, budget your life. Because when you do that, you're creating a larger bank account in heaven, right? Your treasure is in heaven, right? So every time you do something good for somebody, we call that good works for somebody. You've just added to that bank account, that treasure in heaven. When you worship God from the heart every Lord's day, you've added to that account. When you live a life of uh, avoiding temptation and avoiding sin, you've added to that bank account. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about that bank account, that spiritual bank account that's so important and so necessary. And so the missional aspect is to serve God first with what we have. Again, that includes money, but it also includes time. It also includes service. It also includes our lives, right? He doesn't want part of us. He wants all of us. He says that we are to uh, offer our bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service. So that goes well with what we studied a couple weeks ago. With loving God with what? With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, your whole body, everything. Everything that you have, God wants. That's the missional aspect. And then the three principles we want to talk about here as we close. The principle comes from verse 9. He says, here's a lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others. And make friends. Then when your possessions are gone. They will welcome you. To an eternal home. Remember your, your actions influence so many. And uh, there's people that go about. In our congregation. That you don't know about. Who do things like that on a daily basis. Or a weekly basis. We know individuals who. Go to different areas. And they leave money for people. People who need it. And they're anonymous with it. It's an amazing thing to behold the love that people have for the souls of others. But that good is going to have its reward. That good will have its place. 
And so as we go to the principle number two, he says, if you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. Now, Jesus is not, obviously he's making a distinction here. He's not, again, praising the guy for his wicked actions, but he's praising the guy for his ethic of trying to come about with a solution, with an answer, to get something done. That's what he's applauding the guy for. He says, and if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? So there you go. There's worldly wealth that we all kind of think about. We all wish we had more of. But he says, now you got to trust the true riches. That tells me that true wealth is a spiritual wealth. And that all this other worldly stuff, like money, is not. It's false. That's why it's called mammon. That's why it's called, it's named after an evil god from the Syrian culture. But it, again, with emphasis on money, with emphasis on wealth. And if you are not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? There's principle number two that we take away from this story. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other, or you will devote, uh, de be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, or be enslaved to money, according to this particular translation. So it is the third principle from the story. And then we close out with what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 6. He says, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God. Now, going back, it says their trust should be in God. Now that we go back to what Jesus said in our text, where he says, for God or for man should not serve mammon, right? He didn't say that. He didn't say should not. He said cannot. Cannot. Their trust should not, should be in God who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. Paul just summarized that entire story in this paragraph. Seek out to do good works. Now, if you're wealthy and you have money, that's great. You can do more good works with that money. And so Jesus is saying, don't, don't say, say to yourself, well, I can still do some works, even though I have a lot of money. No, he's saying, since you have been blessed with a lot of money, you should be doing greater works, more works with that money that God has blessed you. Learn to share, learn it, to give it to others. Learn to freely and joyfully share it with those who desperately need it. And when we consider the spiritual aspect of that, isn't that what Jesus did himself? We have here the richest person you can imagine. He left his home in glory to come to a cesspool to become poor, to become despised, to become hated, to be beaten, as our brother talked about the communion thought, to be crucified, all because... Of his love for you and for me. And so he gave. He gave abundantly. And we ought to be thankful for that. And he says that's the example. That's the example. Whether wealthy. Whether poor. We give with all that we can give. Money. Time. Self. 
to others. Just as Jesus did. And then upon doing that, Jesus said this. If you believe that, and you believe in me, I want you to be baptized for the remission of your sins. It says, right? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. You're subject to that invitation of Jesus Christ this morning. Once you come forward, as together we stand and sing.